Hello, I'm Jason Blake. This is my partner, April Clapp, and we are your officers in the community response team. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about our presentation when we go out to, into the community and, and do a block watch presentation. But, um, a little bit about what we do in the community response team. Um, we have four what we call major categories. The first is community-oriented policing issues. Um, so going to community events, um, go, doing the block watch program itself, and doing some of the community meetings, we'll, we'll be involved in those things. We do problem-oriented policing, which for those of you who aren't familiar with problem-oriented policing, it's a, I call it a fairly new phenomenon in policing, probably about 10 to 12 years old now. It kind of picked up where community-oriented policing left off. <clears throat> community-oriented policing was very driven towards the police and, and the communities just talking a lot, which is great, but we were missing the mark on how to actually deal with the problems that were identified during that communication piece. So problem-oriented policing, where when we identify a problem or a community or a neighborhood, let's say, identifies a problem, we'll come up with different approaches on how to deal with that problem. It may, it may be a, a crime problem. It may be a quality of life issue that needs to be um, dealt with. And so we'll do that either through directed enforcement, proactive enforcement on our end, um, or if we need to get you know, ourselves or other officers in different divisions in the department involved in doing some directed enforcement on particular issues, whether it be speeding, parking issues, things like that. Um, we're also responsible for doing gang investigations and intelligence, not so much the investigations, but maybe helping uh, our detective units with their gang investigations. So if we have a, a crime that is a gang-related crime, oftentimes we'll do some of the research for them on the gang issues or even do what we call a gang workup to talk about what, what gang this person is a member of, how we know that, how we have validated that information. Um, and then also keeping track of the gang members that do exist in Auburn uh, or who come to Auburn frequently and, uh, you know, what we call documenting those, those people and how we know that they're a gang member. Um, because up until about 2007 in the state of Washington, there were really no sanctions for being a gang member. But in the state of California, they've had these for, for years and years and years. Now, the state legislature has added gang enhancements. So there's an enhancement to the sentencing phase if it's a, if it's a gang-related crime. And then finally, our, our, uh, probably what takes up about 50% of our time is uh, what we call our rental property liaison program, where we work with the owners and managers of rental properties throughout the city. Um, one of the biggest things that we do with them is notify them about incidents that are occurring on their properties. Uh, so if, you know, domestic violence issues, drug issues, um, other crime issues that they need to combat from their end, we'll let them know about that. Because oftentimes it might be something where you just have a problem tenant in a complex, and if that tenant was gone, then things in that complex may smooth out a little bit. So we work very closely with them. We work with a, a lot of managers on a, on a daily and a weekly basis. Um, the other piece that we do, um, it's something that we're actually going to do in September, is a landlord or property owner education day, um, where we have an entire eight-hour day set aside that we're going to educate the owners and landlords in the city um, about things like crime-free housing, um, about what, what we do in the police department in our unit, um, talk about drug recognition, the sales of drugs or the use of drugs. Um, we're even talk things as, as simple as if you've got an, an abandoned car in your property, what can you do with it? So we're going to bring in a, a, one of the tow companies to talk about how that process works and what they need to do legally. And we're also going to bring in an attorney who, do, who specializes in landlord-tenant law to help educate these folks on what their rights and responsibilities are as owners and managers. Okay. You, Jason, do you also report any code violations you might see, like a, if you see a moldy ceiling or anything like that? Absolutely. We work extremely closely. Like We have daily conversations with, our, with, uh, with Jason and now Chris here in, in code enforcement. Um, I don't know, we've talked to him probably about four times so far today on a couple of different uh, project houses that we're working on right now. And because there's one particular house that there's not a lot of criminal problems that are going on at the property itself, but everybody there um, are all involved in criminal activity. But there's a lot of, there's a ton of code violations going on. And so we're working with Jason to help him deal with that property that happens to be one of those, it's kind of a weird owner not occupied house, but it's not a rental type of a thing. So it's a little, we have to think outside the box a little bit to deal with that, with that house. 
Um, and so we're do, we work with code enforcement a lot. Yolanda. Jason, is this a new program or has this been inactive for a little while? In the police department, yeah. it's been since 2008. Uh, as a matter of fact, I started in this unit and then I went into detectives for five years and then I've been back now since October. And uh, are some, most of these landlords locally here or are they from out of state or? You know, it's a pretty even mix. We have a lot of landlords that either live in Auburn or maybe on the, maybe not in the city limits, maybe unincorporated areas, um, but as well as many that live in Kent, Renton, Seattle type area. But then we do have a, several owners who live in California, Arizona, places like that. And some of them will actually contract with uh, management companies like Bell Anderson Properties and things like that to manage their properties. Um, and so a lot of times we'll, we, we've kind of gone through this daunting process of trying to identify all the owners and managers of every rental property in the city. And we're creating this database that's searchable from us either out in the field or, or in our office where we can have that constant contact. So you'll require the rental agency to come to this to this training as well? It's not going to be a required thing. Okay. We're going to okay. offer it, offer. but in the managers that we've been speaking with so far, I think we're, we might actually end up being overwhelmed with the number of people that we're going to get uh, because we're, it's something that we're going to be able to offer for free. Uh, and then in the subsequent years after this, we're actually going to join a, a uh, kind of a, we're going to call it a valley-wide consortium essentially that it's uh, us, the city of Kent, Federal Way, SeaTac, Burien, Tuckwill, I believe where we're going to offer this as a one big collective group that every agency is going to be involved in it. And um, we're going to invite the managers and owners from everywhere in the valley and hold it at a much bigger venue. Okay. And so that's going to be something that's going to occur. Jason, you might want to think about how we could make it a requirement. For instance, make it they have to have attended to get their next business license or something, because this has been a huge problem in Auburn for 50 years of, of uh, landlords who don't do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And we've moved forward quite a bit in the last few years by through the business license process mainly. But I think what you're doing, I didn't realize this fourth bullet existed in your require yeah. your duties. I, I think it's a great opportunity to do even more. And, and, and that's actually one of the things on our list that we've talked about. If, if we're looking kind of into the future, trying to think of things that we could do to improve our own program internally here in the city, of things that we could do. And, and that's been one of the ideas that's been put down on our list is, making a requirement that if that manager hasn't attended one of those trainings somewhere, that they have to attend within, um, you know, six months or, or whatever that magic number ends up being. Uh, but that is actually something we, that we, that we have on our list. So if there's a, a problem at an apartment complex or a home that's being rented out and complaints have come in from neighbors or someone else in the immediate area, is there a follow-up with those folks as to what the status of maybe the situation is? It depends. There are times when we do follow up with those folks. Um, sometimes they come to us anonymously, so they want to they want to complain about the neighbor, but they don't want to tell us who they are. They just want us to know about what's going on. Um, and sometimes they're just like, if you could just take care of the problem, that would be great. Uh, you know, we don't need to talk anymore. I just want you guys to know. Um, so it really, it, it all depends upon what level of involvement that, that complaining party wants to have. Mm -hmm. If they want to be very involved, then we'll keep them up to date as much as we legally and, and you know, possibly can. Um, if, if they don't specify one way or the other, then we'll, we'll make a judgment call on, on the, kind of the severity of the whole issue mm -hmm. versus, you know, the, the greater good, if you will. <laughs> So just in terms of what block watch is, uh, block watch is really all about knowing your community, you know, your, your own little centralized community, your neighborhood. And because there's really nobody that knows my street better than me and my neighbors. And that's the way it should be. And, you know, so we stress being aware of what goes on in your neighborhood. Don't just sit in your house with your blinds closed and never look and see what's going on out in the world. And so we recommend know who your neighbors are. If, uh, you know, even if you don't want to be best friends with them, at least get to know who they are so that you can have a conversation when you can acknowledge them when you're out in the community or when you're out in your front yard mowing the, mowing the grass that you can at least have a conversation with them. Uh, but not only that, but that awareness allows you to realize when something's not right. Because, unfortunately, we can't be everywhere at all times. 
It would be nice if we could, but it's just not practical. And so we really re rely on the people that live in the neighborhoods to be able to be that extra set of eyes and ears. Going into that. Um, well, that last bullet <clears throat> on phone numbers, emails, a lot of people are real sensitive about giving that to anybody they don't know or the city. Do you allow people to be listed by name only, or do they have to give you that contact information in order to be on the block watch list? It's not required that they that they provide that information. Good. A couple of things that we will that we will say is that if something is happening in the neighborhood and there is a there's a neighborhood wide email that's gone out or um, some sort of social media message that's gone out, you're not going to be involved in that. And you're not going to know what's going on. So that's the one way we kind of stress that as much as it is there's that level of discomfort with it that you know a phone number and an email address is really pretty benign you know in terms of what information somebody can find out about you through that and so if you want to have that level of knowledge that everybody else in the neighborhood has then you know provide at least some vehicle of information sharing. So you encourage it but don't require it right mm -hmm. Good. and we've and we've also gotten to the point where we've encouraged neighborhoods to be um, a little outside the box in their and they're sharing their information in the neighborhood. I mean, everybody's got Facebook nowadays or Tumblr, or Twitter, you know, uh, Pinterest and everything else. You, I mean, you know, they're all free, so we, we encourage people, well, whatever you find that is, is beneficial for everybody, use it. It doesn't hurt. Um, then, we, you know, we spoke about being that, that extra set of eyes and ears for the neighborhood. Um, you know, that we, we can't stress that enough. That's, that's one thing that... You know, the police can't always have a car sitting on, on, on the neighborhood. Um, so everybody in the neighborhood has to be that extra set of eyes and ears for each other and for the police because, uh, you know, we have one community, and I'm sure everybody's somewhat familiar with the community, but um, they've got a pretty strong neighborhood watch group that they've got a, a person who is pretty diligent about putting information out to the neighborhood. Um, and... So we encourage people that, you know, maybe not go to that extreme of, you know, becoming where you're, you know, perhaps a, a point where you're flooding somebody's e uh, email inbox all the time, but at least that you're communicating. So, um, and share that information. If this is just something strange that's going on, you know, people need to do a better job of shutting their garage doors at night or locking their cars, things like that. Make sure that, you know, we're communicating that to the rest of the neighborhood. Um, some of the most common neighbor, you know, crimes that, that are identified in a neighborhood uh, include burglary, thefts, mail theft, vehicle prowls, vehicle thefts, and vandalism. What about speeding? We don't include that because it's technically considered a civil infraction. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, but we should, we should include traffic, traffic complaints in there as well because that's, I would say, probably of all of those, the traffic complaints are probably the most predominant complaint that we receive. Jason, what is the time frame for a police officer to report, um, to come to a um, call? It really depends. Um, and, and we're actually going to touch on it here. Um, we're going to touch on it here in just a moment. Okay. All right. Um, and then, you know, we're talking about being that eyes and the ears for your neighborhood. Uh, we talk about different types of suspicious behavior that should warrant a phone call to the to the police or to the others in your block watch community. Um, so we use things like you know prolonged loitering, whether they're sitting in a car in the neighborhood or just sitting on a curb and don't seem to be generally doing anything other than just kind of keeping an eye on what's going on in the neighborhood. Um, what we call aggressive knocking, or what we like to term the the, the doorbell or door knocking test. Um, that's been a big thing over the last probably three to four years. Uh, in the burglary world where um, the suspects will go up and they'll, they'll knock aggressively at your door, ring your doorbell multiple times, see if anybody comes to the door. And if nobody comes to the door, then they break in. Uh, oftentimes that is right after they've done the prolonged loitering because they've been sitting in your neighborhood watching kind of the, the comings and goings of everybody in the neighborhood. Um, the going door to door with, a, with an odd story or sales pitch is one thing that we, we get a lot of calls about these um, weird salesmen. They'll show up and they don't have any type of ID on them and they only have one pamphlet for whatever product it is that, they're, that they claim that they're selling. So that's a little odd. If you're a true salesman, you've got a box full of stuff, you've got a name tag and you, and you look somewhat officious, 
And if you've done everything right, you've gone and got your city business license to sell door to door and things like that. Um, you get these guys that are walking through the neighborhood paying attention to all the vehicles, looking at which ones are locked and unlocked, which ones may have keys left in the ignition, uh, or keys that are sitting in the center console, um, or driving excessively slow through a neighborhood. You know, we all appreciate a nice 25 mile an hour you know, speed through our neighborhood, maybe in some neighborhoods even slower, but these are the guys that are driving you know, 10 miles an hour that they're basically just idling down the road. Um, their unwillingness to make eye contact with anybody in the neighborhood. They just walk down the they just walk down the street like this. They don't look at anybody. They don't want. Basically, they're trying to keep their anonymity. They don't want anybody to know who they are. They don't want any, want anybody to know what they look like. Um, and then they dress in a manner that's inconsistent with the weather. So, in weather like we're having today, where it's warm outside, um, these are the guys that are going to wear the big snow parkas, the you know hoodies that are with the hoods over their head. I'm sorry, it's too hot for that. It really, I mean, it's just very, it's, it's odd dress. Okay. How about you, if you've got young kids dressed like that and going door to door? That would be odd. That would be suspicious. Unless they're carrying around a, a wagon it full of Girl Scout tax. cookies or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, if there, it, it's, it's one of those things that, and, and I put it up here, if it doesn't feel, look, sound right, it's probably not. And we would much rather get that phone call and say that there's this suspicious activity for us to go out and investigate it and find out that it wasn't suspicious. There is something legitimate going on. We would rather that than people say, ah, they're probably just doing this. Come to find out there are, you know, two members of a much larger burglary ring or an auto theft ring. Uh, one misnomer is that, you know, so I called the police and nobody showed up. That's not true. Every call that we get to 911 in the city of Auburn, you will get an officer to, that will respond in some way, shape, or form, whether it be via phone, in-person contact, whatever the requested method of response is, is what you will get from the Auburn Police Department. And you know, some people say, well, I think you're, I'm wasting your time because I, it just seems kind of odd to me and I wasn't really sure. Well, we would rather have you call than not. Um, and some people say, well, I don't want to call 911 because that's tying up a 911 line. Fair enough, we have a non-emergency line now. That's something that's fairly new um, through our dispatch center only within probably the last uh, year and a half. Um, so we provide that phone number as well. And then we have a third mechanism of, of reporting, which is the online reporting. Um, that's always there as well. But we always say, if it's something that's in progress, don't file an, on an online report because that's something that nobody's gonna see for several hours. And if it's something that's happening right now, we wanna address it now versus 10 to 12, 15 hours. <clears throat> uh, and then uh, there's always some question about, you know, how does that whole night calling 911 process work? What, you know, what, what happens? What am I supposed to do when I call 911? Um, the first most important thing that we always suggest everybody is have an idea of where you are. Uh, people rely too much on the GPS function and the, the phase two wireless component in 911. Everybody's got to remember there's still a degree of error in that. You know, it might, it might put you in the right, blow, you know, the right general vicinity, but it still might be 300 yards off. And if it's something that, you know, you need an officer right there, you know, we don't want to be 300 yards off. Can, uh, you, make, can you make an anonymous 911 call or is that not Yes, you can. Anonymous 911 calls are still acceptable. Um, they're still going to, they're still going to know who's calling. But in terms of how that information gets entered into the system, the dispatchers always put in their reporting party request to remain anonymous. And so, but they would put your cell phone number in if you were calling a cell phone? Because it may be something that um, being anonymous may not be a factor. If it's, say, somebody called about an, an active shooter, let's say, once that's all said and done with, that's somebody that is going to be a, a phenomenal witness and we're going to have to at least talk with them. Whether or not they get involved down the road when it goes to court may be a different story. But for the interim, they may be the only person who actually saw what was going on. But so some people don't want to be a witness. They don't want to be involved. But Agreed. they want to report just Agreed. to keep things safe. And apparently you're saying they can do that if they want to. They, they can do it if they want to. Okay. Um, and uh, there's always the question of why do I get asked so many questions? Well, because the call taker is not there they don't get to they don't have the luxury of seeing what the reporting party is seeing so they're going to have a lot of questions for you um, 
And so we just ask, you know, be a good witness and provide the information that, that's being asked of you. Some of the questions may seem somewhat redundant, maybe even a little ridiculous to you, but they have a kind of a standard order of questions, which was all brought because of, we want them to ask those questions. Because for us, they're basically doing us a favor by, we want to have a, be able to paint at least a fairly decent picture by the time we, we go into an unknown situation than just saying, well, there's some guy that's shooting people here. Well, if we, we would like to know some more information. Um, but for that. And then after, you're, uh, after you've made your 911 call, the, the uh, call receiver takes that information and gets entered into a, to a, what we call a CAD database. And that call is broken down by what jurisdiction? Because as you all know, Valleycom dispatches for many police agencies, many fire jurisdictions. And so based on the address, in the, in the, or maybe even the coordinates, depending upon where you're calling from, that call gets kind of electronically shipped to the correct dispatcher. And then from there, it goes into that dispatcher's what we call their pending queue until there's an officer free to be able to respond to that call. And then the officer, uh, once they're free, or once somebody is free, they get dispatched to that call. And then the officer responds, like, like we said before, whether it be you know, they request for phone contact, they want an area check, they need to make a report, things like that, and then it gets handled that way. And for, uh, for Auburn, you know, with a population of on the, on the border of about 72,000, got you know, 30 square miles of, uh, encompassing the city and over 500 miles of roadway, um, we, got, we have a lot of area to cover, a lot of people to serve, and um, right now we have about six officers is our minimum with a, with a supervisor. So sometimes it does take us a little bit longer than we would really like to get there, but we're always going to respond. Sometimes it might take us five minutes, sometimes it might take us a couple hours, but we're going to respond uh, if, if somebody calls 911. We're gonna, you're going to get a response. So if somebody you know, ever tells you guys, well, the cops never showed up, well, they did. They may not have been there in two minutes like you wanted them to be, but next we're going to talk about why. Oh, wait, no. I, I thought that was my next slide, but I forgot we cut it out. Um, so the reason we respond in the way we do, there's, a, there's actually a method to our madness. We have calls that we prioritize one through four. Priority one are your highest priority calls. So your shootings, your robberies, um, things like that. And then you have your priority four calls, which are your things like um, my bike was stolen three months ago. I don't know who stole it. It just got stolen off the front yard. That's something that, you know, it, it unfortunately is going to go down to the lowest level in the priority. But the call of the husband beating his wife is going to jump way up in priority. So we have to handle all priority one calls get, res get handled first, and then obviously two, three, and then finally the, the priority four calls. And the priority that's assigned is dependent upon the circumstances. So if, if somebody said that, you know, my bike got stolen three months ago, it's going to be a lower priority. But they say, my bike is being stolen right now. Here's the description of the guy. He's riding down my street. That's going to actually get a higher level of priority. And we're going to respond to that quicker than that three months ago it got stolen. Okay. All right. We talk about crime prevention. Um, what we call the DOA of crime, desire, opportunity, and ability. And... We always ask, you know, point out which one that we can all control, because, which is sort of the impetus behind doing a block watch, which for us is obviously, you know, for a, a community is going to be the opportunity. Keep up. All right. Um, when we take away somebody's opportunity to do anything, it makes it very difficult, if not impossible, for them to do it. It doesn't necessarily have to be a crime, but it can be anything. If we take away a swimmer's ability to swim, to move their arms, then we've taken away that opportunity for them to swim. And so, which is what we stress so much in the crime prevention component of block watch. So we encourage people to be, uh, you know, nosy and be observant of what's going on in their neighborhood and to communicate with each other because the more we do that, the more we take away those opportunities to commit those crimes. If a criminal comes into the neighborhood with the plans of starting to break into cars, but there's four neighbors that are out, and every single one of them is watching that person do things. 
that opportunity has been taken away from them because they've lost their anonymity and they've lost that ability to do it, right? And then that last component of it is making sure that we're calling the police because we oftentimes get things, well, God, our, we're, our neighborhood is just getting hammered up here. So before we go and do a block watch, we always check the statistics on the 911 calls that were placed for that area, the reports that we've taken for that area, and oftentimes there is a large disparity between those two. And they say that their, their neighborhood is just getting, is just off the hook and it's getting blasted and we find that they've had two 911 calls to the neighborhood in the last eight months. Well, if we don't know about it, we can't give it attention, right? So we need to, we need to make sure those, those things are happening. Um, in crime prevention in your homes, you know, there's always the big ones of making sure that you're locking all of your doors and your windows. And we even suggest for the windows in the sliding glass doors, if you get the, uh, you get the blocks or you take a wooden broom handle, cut it down to size and put it in the, in the window to make it uh, so it doesn't slide open. Uh, we stress lighting, especially motion detection uh, lights that come on when, in, you know, sometimes if you live in certain areas, it's a little counterproductive because you have a lot of raccoons or things like that that come in there. Uh, that's my problem out in Enumclaw. Um, alarms, you know, we, there's always the debate of silent versus audible alarms. Well. Here's kind of the theory behind the two. Audible alarms were intended to scare people away. Silent alarms were intended to catch people doing bad things. And then now you have what's called the Sonitrol alarm, which gives, well, and even Xfinity is now doing this, it has a, a little add-on component to where you can actually hear inside the house. I don't know if I'm a huge fan of that because it seems a little like some Xfinity employee could be listening to things in my <laughs> house, but uh, you know, that's, all, that's always a possibility. So. It's really up to you and, and what you think is the best bet for you. A lot of people choose to do the audible alarm. Sometimes it's a little bit cheaper for monitoring. Um, and they would just rather somebody not break into their house. And others are like, oh, if they break in my house, I want them caught. So they want to do the silent route, a personal decision. Um, and then another thing that, we, that we've begun to stress a lot more over the last couple of years is what's, uh, we call it SEPTED, but it's crime prevention through environmental design. And throw up a couple of examples that April and I found on our travels um, about good versus bad crime prevention through environmental design. So on the left, we have what, we, what we're calling good examples. And pretty much the, the theory behind pr crime prevention through environmental design is that there are things that you can do on your property to make your property more visible and uh, a less likely target. So things like <clears throat> on the left, you can see that the vegetation is trimmed up, the, house, you know, the doors and the windows and everything are very visible, and they've got some lighting going on on the outside. But on the right, you see the, the bushes are severely grown. You can hardly see any of the windows. You can't see any of the doors from here. So you know, if I'm a, if I'm a burglar, I'm going to decide which of these places I'm going to break into. I'm going to break into the place that's going to give me that that ability to be clandestine when I go in there, that nobody's going to see me going in. And so um, we actually started stopping and, and talking to homeowners and, and businesses who were letting their, their properties look like the right and say, you're just asking to be burglarized or you're asking to become a victim of a crime. Um, and there's some, now we're starting to get more requests for, for businesses you know, asking us, will you come walk around our property and give us a, just a, some advice on what we should do? So we started doing that a little bit more now as well. Um, but, you know, crime prevention through environmental design is, is something that can often take your house from being a, a very desirable target to a very undesirable target with really very minimal cost a few hours of your time. <coughs> for, uh, for vehicles, uh, we talk about, you know, making sure you lock your cars. Don't store valuable items like your iPads and your laptop computers and your cell phones and things like that. Or your big wad of Starbucks money in the center console. Um, and believe it or not, we still have to say this today, don't leave your keys in your car or leave your car running. Um, we still have a lot of auto thefts that occur in this city every year because people say, well, it's too cold outside. Well, would you rather be a little bit cold where your car warms up and still have your car or not have your car at all? Uh, and some people don't even think about it in that, in that correlation. Uh, and we also recommend getting some sort of security or anti-theft device. You know, there's, you know, car alarms have been on the market for 40 years. 
Um, but, you know, they're becoming more sophisticated, you know, things where you can monitor from your cell phone now. Um, and then there's also what are uh, aftermarket microchip devices where you can actually have the microchip installed into somewhere on the dash on your car, which basically kills the connection on, on your electrical system in your car so that there's not that loop that the, the, your ignition system requires to actually start. There's a lot of car manufacturers that are, that that's becoming standard in their, in their car keys nowadays that the chip is actually embedded into the key so that if you lose your car keys, you're in a world of hurt. Because even your valet key is not going to start your car anymore. It used to be where you could start it with a valet key. Um, but, you know, those microchip devices are, are pretty inexpensive. I would say probably less than $300 uh, installed at places like car toys and things like that. And um, your insurance company gives you a, a, a discount, up, some of them up to 20% discount for having things like that. Uh, we also recommend uh, vehicle tracking systems, especially if you own certain makes and models of cars. Um, things like LoJack, Skylink, and OnStar. OnStar is only available on GM manufactured products, but Skylink and LoJack are both available aftermarket. Uh, LoJack is, has been around now for probably close to 20 years. Um, probably the most popular vehicle tracking system on, on the market. Uh, it's expensive. It's about $900 installed, but it's, uh, you have a very high guarantee of getting your car back. Um, it is one of those things that's trackable by, the, by law enforcement. So it sends out radio waves, and then those radio waves go to little units that are in, the, in many police cars that can receive those and start giving that law enforcement officer a directionality where that signal is coming from when they get within between one and five miles of the car, depending upon the, the terrain of the area. Um, here in Auburn, because we're urban, it's, it, we, have a, we have a pretty good range, except for sometimes we get some of the buildings. Seattle, it's a little bit different because you have a lot more of the high rises that block some of those signals. Um, Skylink, though, is, is a fairly new product, only been on the market a couple of years, and it is GPS based. And you can, you can actually track it yourself. It doesn't need to be the police that can track it. You can actually track it yourself. And when I was working in detectives, working in auto theft, I actually had two successful recoveries of cars with people using Skylink and saying, hey, I found my car. Here it is. I go out there, and sure enough, there's their car. Um, so Skylink, I'm not sure exactly how expensive that is. I've tried to get them to, to give me some, some uh, specifications on it. I'm having a hard time linking up with anybody from their company, which seems kind of weird to me. But... Um, it is what it is. Lojack, though, I'm very familiar with, and uh, it's a great product, um, but it's expensive. Uh, then we talk about documenting your valuables, and um, when we talk about documenting your valuables, we talk about when you buy uh, when you buy new items. Write down the brand, the model, and the serial number of your of your property, whether that be for your TV, your cell phone, your firearm whatever it is you have, that you have to have all that information. Um, and, there, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it's once, if, if you report that item stolen, we can actually enter that property into a nationwide database. And so any police officer in the United States, if they run into that Huffy bicycle with this serial number in New York, and they run that through the database, they're going to show that that bicycle was reported stolen to the Auburn Police Department in Washington State. So it helps, it increases our ability to recover property. Not only that, but when uh, items are stolen, they often end up in pawn shops. And we actually have access to a database in the police department, it's called Leads Online, that we can track property that is sent to, a, or is taken into a pawn shop. Because pawn shops are required every 24 hours to report their transactions to local law enforcement. So. Um, one way that we've encouraged the use of leads online is to say that you're fulfilling your requirement because it used to be they'd have to write all these, handwrite all these things, then they would have to fax every pawn ticket to the police department every morning. And so we've encouraged them, use leads online because it still fulfills your requirement per state law and it gives us a better ability to track it because we can run those things either by description, by the serial number, um, and it doesn't even have to be a very specific description. We can just look up gold ring with a uh, whatever sort of cut diamond in it. And we'll get all of them that were pawned in the state of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And so we can 
take the time consuming task of actually looking through all those. But, um, you know, if the person doesn't know their serial number, that makes it a little bit more difficult. But if they have their serial number and they say, oh, I had a steel lawn blower and, uh, you know, here's the serial number, I can look up steel lawn blower and it'll tell me, oh, yeah, I was pawned at the pawn exchange on Auburn Way North. And we can go and recover that property, get it back to the owner. Um, so, but now, you know, as I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, this new system that, that uh, is coming online here this year, TrackMole. TrackMole is a great product. Uh, we're using it in the police department very regularly, and we're uh, encouraging its use to the citizens. Um, it basically gives you the ability to have an online uh, listing of all of the property that you own. You can go in there, you can create an account, which is free to you, and you can go in there and list all of your valuables, at least anything that you would ever want back or that you can, that you can track. And it will allow you to go in there and put in the, the make, model, and serial number of all of your property. But when you do that, it gives the police department the ability to see that. So if we are walking down the street and we happen to find this steel lawn blower sitting on the side of the street, we can run that through track mole and it'll say, oh, well, Joe Smith uh, put that into our system as, as his property on this day and time. So we can call Mr. Smith and have him identify his property again, which is yet another way that we can get property back. So I haven't stressed enough, it's very important to keep all the make model serial number of your property. Uh, next we'll talk about graffiti a little bit. Uh, this is graffiti that was up on the, uh, that was down off of F Street Southeast. All right, so graffiti. Um, there's kind of this misnomer of what graffiti tr truly is. Some people think that every piece of graffiti you see out there has got to be a gang. Not necessarily true. We have a lot of tagger, what we call tagger crews in Auburn, or actually we'll just say in the South County. Um, so there's a big difference between gang style tagging and tagger crew style tagging. The tagging you saw in that picture before, that is gang style tagging. It's very linear, not much to it versus the tagger crew is the very you know, artistic looking, big bubbly letters and things like that that you see on the side of the train, under the overpasses, off, of, off the inner urban and things like that. A lot of that is tagger, tagger crew style um, tagging. And then we always get, well, what if I see tagging? What, you know, what should I do? Or if I have tagging on my property, what should I do? So under the city ordinance, it gives you basically 15 days to remove that, remove that uh, <coughs> graffiti off your property. And some people suffer this more than others, and the city uh, understood that plight. So part of our ordinance is that we'll help you once every six months. We'll, we'll help you through Parker Paint get a free gallon of paint. They'll try to match it as best they can to the paint that was there, but there's no guarantees. But at the same time, it's free paint. Um, and we also stress the you know, over the last few years, there's been some of these paint manufacturers who have created create what they call anti-graffiti paint. I don't want to say that it's anti-graffiti, it's just easier to clean up graffiti paint. Um, that it actually cleans up with very minimal uh, work on, it, on anybody's part. And then there, there's some of them that they've taken that a step further and they've got detergents that they, you can spray on it and then it'll just wash right off. It's very expensive, but if you're one of those who gets hit a lot, it might be worth the investment after a while. In terms of reporting it, we have three different ways that, well, Really, there's probably four different ways. Um, there's uh, the phone number there at the top, extension number seven, where you can report the graffiti. You can do it via the online, the police department's online reporting system, or you can just call the police and have them come and take a report. Or there's the YourGov app, which uh, will report it in the same manner. Go to the next one. And the YourGov app, we stress the YourGov app uh, quite a bit, um, just because sometimes it's just easier. If somebody just wants to report it and move on, and they don't want to wait around for a police officer, they don't want to go online and, and do all of that. This is basically doing it online without having to spend as much time because this takes literally 30 seconds to do. Um, the app is free. It's available on both the uh, Android market as well as the uh, Apple iTunes store. We actually have it on our work phones and sometimes if there's certain things that we want code enforcement to know about, we'll, we'll use the YourGov app. And so uh, Jason knows about them. Um, 
And so that way you can report everything from, everything from potholes to tall, noxious weeds to um, too much garbage in somebody's yard to graffiti. And we get a lot of these every week. We get a, a lot of these online reports this way. Um, and it's been pretty successful because it's, it's helped us be able to track those things better. And we always have that mechanism of going back to, to make sure that we're hitting all of those areas that we should be hitting. Good. That's the major portion of it. We always like to leave time for questions if anybody has any. Questions? Jason, you, when you talk about the priorities of the, of the crimes, how is that established? Does that come to you folks as it's a priority one, two, three, or four? Or is it yes. established in the field? That, that criteria is built in through Valley Comp's system. Okay. That, um, and if I remember right, I think they can override it. But it's, it's usually attached to what we call the type code of the call. So if there's, you know, say an assault, they may have the option of, um, you know, seven different types of assaults, whether it's an assault with a weapon, without a weapon, in progress, not in progress. And so those type codes are associated to um, a priority status that has kind of been vetted over the, I think it took us about five years finally through that whole process of deciding we wanted to go through a new CAD system to the day that we finally went live. I think it was about five years. Um, and so through all the various levels of committees, you know, from the users group all the way to the administration uh, group, um, we went through those and, and vetted those and said, okay, well, if it's this kind of call, it should have, generally should be this priority. Um, those, you know, sometimes those factors can change and sometimes we'll, we'll kind of change the priority on the fly based on the details of the call. If, if they're not able to manipulate that, then we'll change the priority internally. Another question for homeowners or actually anybody that has property, but uh, security cameras, I didn't hear you talk about that. Is that being talked about more for um, potential deterrence and is it really effective? I would say yes and no. I'll say yes that sometimes it, it does become a, a good deterrent. So sometimes we recommend, you know, if we understand that not everybody can go out and spend hundreds or even thousands of dollars on these very elaborate security systems. But, you know, it, sometimes you can find at a garage sale or even at some of uh, like places like Radio Shack where they'll sell the dummy cameras that sometimes they're a great deterrent and they're pretty cheap. Um, takes two minutes to, to install them, you know, however long it takes you to put four screws into, the, in, into wherever you're going to install it. Um, all the way up to, you know, there's, we've met some homeowners who have these very elaborate, as a matter of fact, the last block watch I went to, uh, one of the guys has got this camera system that is almost as good as the casinos. It, it was just, I mean, it was amazing what this guy could do with his cameras. And he had a million, I, there wasn't a piece of his property that was not covered by a camera. This guy had invested thousands of dollars in his camera system, which was like, wow, that's kind of amazing, but it's better than half the businesses do, you know. Um, but if you're, gonna, if you're going to do a camera system, if you're going to make that investment, we, we say it's kind of like, it's kind of like buying a car. If you're going to buy a car, buy something good. Don't just go buy the cheapest thing on the market. Go find something good that's going to meet all of your needs and is going to, you know, be usable for you in the long term, not just something that because you, you felt that if, if you're just going to buy the $100 special somewhere, you might as well just buy the dummy cameras and put them up because they're going to be just as good as the dummy cameras. And because the quality of the video footage is, is horrible, the bad guy could be this far from the camera lens and you still couldn't identify him if you tried. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, that's probably the biggest battle that we, that we run into with, with cameras is, is that the quality is, is typically what lacks. 